It's, it's my pleasure to introduce um, uh, Mark Simpson to this class today. So um, we, we have um, two composers having pieces um, played, uh, played through and discussed by Mark, and also a clarinetist, um, uh, Seb Marshall. Um, I wonder if, are there any clarinetists here? I mean, Matthew Walker is not a, is not a name that I recognize. Ma Matthew, are you a clarinetist? If you're in yet? Yes. Oh, here you are. Yes, right. That's wonderful. So we have we have composers and we have representatives from the clarinet community, which is which is terrific. Um, so I just thought I'd just um, introduce Mark and just ask him. Um, so Mark, how have the last three months been for you? Um, <laughs> uh, up and down, really. I mean, to begin with, I kind of um, I decided that I was going to be super productive and practice and and write and work out and be healthy and and you know I wasn't going to let the the lockdown defeat me and then gradually over the couple of the last I would say the last four four or five weeks or so that's just that's kind of slightly disintegrated <laughs> slightly yeah. ground I slightly ground to a halt because I think like everybody um I'm just absolutely kind of sick of this whole <laughs> state of yeah. of state of affairs at the moment and um yeah, I mean, you know, I've, uh, I think what I would say to, to you know, uh, if anyone is, if anyone is kind of feeling it, you know, and they're, they're, they're kind of struggling a bit and is, is try, you know, try not to be too hard on yourself during this, this period. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I am my own worst critic and I have got a terrible inner saboteur and it, it's been raging in the last couple of weeks towards me and I've, I've you know and I just had to kind of I had to kind of really put that at bay and and try and kind of be a bit be a bit neutral I mean it's difficult to know what to do when everything is so in flux and everything is so uncertain but um, yeah I think if, if there's one thing I would say is just that you know just try and try and try and be good to yourself and be kind to yourself mentally during this period because it can get you know, especially if you're alone or you don't have much contact with people, it can become, you know, a, a vicious spiral. So, yeah, just look after yourselves, I would say. Yes, because I suppose the difficulty is if we knew it was going to be a three month lockdown, then it was all going to stop. We're going to go back to normal. We could probably discipline ourselves better. But mm. it's it's almost a bit worse now because we don't quite know what we can do, what we can't do, when it's going to end. And people are quite make good resolves at the beginning. So, um you know, obviously, I hope that, um, you know, I think it's been amazing because the students I've had have been able to carry on writing, you know, and I was really? like, absolutely, because you know, I've not written very much. And, um, and I think just to be able to sort of keep some kind of self-discipline, but there's a, there comes a point when you think, it, you know, you just need something different, you know, so. so yeah, um, yeah, I think from my point of view, um, the one, when, when my, my, my kind of uh, inner saboteur kind of starts to flare up, it's when the when the notion of why when the question of why starts to really become present you know well, well why why am i doing this and what does this mean and what is the purpose of this and that's one one of the ways it happens i think that has really just been exacerbated by the 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 the, the, the kind of the state of the industry at the moment not, not just the classical music industry but the whole of the arts sector is is on its knees at the moment I mean, and 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 there's such uncertainty i think i i wish in a kind i kind of wish i was in you know in, in an institution in a way or in connected to some kind of hub of 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 connectivity because yeah. i i I'm, I'm very much kind of like working on my own and and um and the the kind of the the, the music that i write and the work that i do is 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 dependent on an industry which is which for all intents and purposes no longer exists so there's been this really kind of um i would say like uh an existential kind of deep philosophical kind of questioning as to you know really what is the purpose of you know my my day-to-day -day life um so you know just the usual kind of small things that i think about now and again <laughs> I suppose we have to be positive and think that this self-questioning that we're thinking about why we're doing it is going to have a beneficial effect and might help what we write in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, I think um, the the main question now, uh, I mean, the, the thing that I'm thinking about the most is, you know, what, uh, how can the how can the music that I'm writing resonate in a kind of post-COVID world?
So I, I started. I'm, I'm, I started the the lockdown. Uh, started writing a violin concerto, um, which is for Nicola Benedetti in the LSO, which is meant to be in April next year. And I'd gotten about two. I'd gotten about ten minutes of sketched material, and you know, two movements or so through. And about three or four weeks ago, I just thought this bears no relation to the emotional landscape at the moment of what people are thinking and and i think and so i that's i kind of made a decision to to stop with that material and then to try and find something which might resonate a bit more because i don't know it apart from a kind of a, apart from music being a kind of a form of entertainment in 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 some ways i think there's a there's a healing quality to music um, not just in terms of the togetherness of the experience, but also the actual, the content of what the, the what what the music is saying, the message of the music, and yeah. so that's kind of where I'm 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 trying to go at the moment is to try and find some kind of um, restorative or um, healing kind of um, but, um, uh, DNA or essence to the music yeah. that I'm so. Yeah, it's, it's 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 a really really tricky time, and it's it's such a nice day outside as well. Like we've got all these existential things to think about. <laughs> oh, well, it, where I am, the weather is terrible, so it's it perhaps a bit easier to sort of think. But I mean, the, well, thank well, the weather has been pretty amazing the last three months, which in some yeah. senses has made it easier. But in other senses, you're thinking, no, I want you know, it stopped thought. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, I, I think that these are great points that we can perhaps um, tie into what some of the composers are doing now and indeed some of the performers. Mm -hmm. So so in this, just to say, so we're having three people being featured, particularly the composer James Ch Chan, then the clarinetist Seb Marshall, and then the composer Athanasia Kontu. And um, so, so we have, and what I'd really love is for all of you here to be involved, you're all watching, and um, to, to ask questions, I mean, if clarinetists want to ask composers things, if clar composers want to communicate with clarinetists, that would be wonderful. But I mean, I think we should probably press on. And, um, and, and I think, James, you're the first person to be featured. So perhaps it'd be good if you just tell us a little bit about your piece. I'm James Chan. I'm in the fourth year of the joint course between Royal Northern and Uni of Manchester, studying with Gary. Um, my piece is called um, To Partake of Eternity, and then the title is taken from a passage from To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf, and it's kind of basically about um, how sort of minute things in everyday life can sort of take on the quality that seem to sort of last forever, I guess. Um, and the novel is kind of also about the various ways we can sort of live beyond the um, uh, ephemeral quality of, of of human lives, basically. Quite apt at the moment. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it is a little bit. <laughs> yeah.
Bravo, bravo. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. <laughs> An absolutely beautiful piece. I've listened to this piece four times today already. Um, <laughs> I think it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, the, the, the harmonic sound world, the, the textural uh, sound, um, the, the pacing, the control, I think it's, um, I think it's a really excellent piece. You should be very proud of. So this was written in 2018. Yeah. So it was, um, yeah, last year. So you were so you were a third so you were a third year then, I think so yeah yeah it's it's very it's very impressive it's it, you know thank you who knows um, I um, th there's there's a lot of stuff we can kind of like uh, delve into here um, the, the these are the the idea of 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 a kind of a spiritual music or a trans uh, transcendental transient music is something that I'm I'm interested in um, and there seem to be uh, for me, there's a kind of uh, a resonance with uh, Jonathan Harvey in particular, um, and and Tranquil Abiding, the piece he wrote for BBC Scottish. Right. Do you do you know that piece? Uh, not that I, I I have I have heard it, but the um, the one piece that I really like is um, Tour to Pure Land. Yeah, um, that particularly influenced this piece with the sort of really quiet and sort of their mi uh, middle section mm. that piece mm. of, yeah because i because i originally wanted to sort of basically imitate that with um with a sort of, uh, it's held off in, the, in the quiet section uh, Sorry, just, we just lost you just well, tiny bit there. we just lost you a tiny bit there oh, you right. want to imitate imitate uh towards a pillar uh, is that right yeah with the shape that sort of um sort of concentrate the focuses in right. onto this um tranquil middle section sure and so sort of, um i just sort of left it at the um, tranquil yeah i mean for, for i i think for me actually i mean it, it has more of a kind of resonance with tranquil abiding and as you know tranquil abiding has that that kind of um, absolutely gorgeous chord progression, which just goes over two bars. It's kind of a warm, warm, and it, every every two bars has this sway between one other thing, and it kind of breathes like this. And you get the sense of you really get the sense of breathing. And obviously, Jonathan Harvey being a a, a Buddhist um, himself and 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 a, and, a, and a yogi to some respect he's you know breathing is a huge in part of his of his music and and, mm. and that the, the one thing I would say about that device in that piece though is that the that harmonic progression does get tired after a certain right. amount of time the chords themselves are beautiful and I think as I think the the, the chords you've chosen in the harmonic world is, is, is really alluring. You know, you, you, it's, you, you kind of, you, you, you really want to listen to it. Um, and the kind of the textural over, uh, over layering in the, in the harmonics and the wind as well, this kind of um, filigree thing is, is, you know, it's, um, it's beautiful. But what happens, I think for me is that uh, from a, around B to, to D, I, I, I want either a, a kind of textural shift or a harmonic shift and or, or maybe even a, a maybe even slightly playing around with the with with the, um, the, the the time between each kind of vertical thing um, sure, yeah. because you, you, you set up that 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 world so well from the, from the opening and then by that but by by B I, I, I probably would say it, it's very, it's much of the same. I, I, I love the harmonic shift at 38. It's like, there's a kind of, yeah, a new kind of sense of drama there. And that, that really kind of makes us, us, us kind of prick our ears up there and, and, and tune in a bit more. I, the, I mean, I mentioned Jonathan Harvey, the other person I, whose music I adore and who also has a very strong spiritual element is Georges Lentz, L-E-N-T-Z. Oh, right. Um, for those of you who don't know, Georges Lentz is a Luxembourgian composer who plays violin in the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. That's his full-time job. And he just happens to be, I think, probably one of the world's best composers on the side. Um, he, uh, his music, it, well, it, he has um, uh, like this large scale kind of 
um, set of, 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 of pieces which are all connected to this big, um, they're all kind of in a, a, an umbrella, um, it's called uh, Mysterium. Um, and he's interested in um, Aboriginal philosophy. He's interested in kind of French um, French philosophy from the 17th century, astronomy. Um, you know, the, st the first time I heard a piece of his, I, I just bought a CD because I'd, I'd never heard of him before. And I whacked it on and I, and I was so taken by it. And I, I didn't read the, the, the CD notes. And I thought, this, this is the stars. This is like the dawn of time. This is like creation. And in fact, the piece was called Stars. Um, and it's, he, it's, but all of his titles have a kind of Aboriginal, um, they're, they're in an Aboriginal language. So I, I won't try and pronounce it because I will probably get it wrong as well. Um, just as well, thinking about, thinking about, um, uh, because the, the, you know you mentioned you, you mentioned briefly in the beginning that the the waves um, where and and there is a very kind of ebb and flow kind of quality to this piece. There's a there's another piece which explores kind of um, you know the sea and the waves uh, of more recently, which by the French composer Tristan Murai. Oh. Uh, there's a piece of his for orchestra called Le Partage des Eaux. Um, and in, just in terms of the drama of the ocean and also the complexity of the sound, there are some, there are some chords in the, that piece which are, well, well, I've never heard before, you know, they're really, really brilliant. Um, and the other thing I was thinking of was just the kind of the static nature of the piece and, and maybe in relation to, um, to, to Mort, Morton Feldman. And yeah, the, Feldman. Yeah, and whether you're a fan of Moten Feldman and, and in particular Coptic Light, I got that kind of sense, mm. the kind of shimmer in nature of the piece. Um, I, 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 so I just don't know, and also a kind of like a bit of Takamitsu as well. And yeah, so definitely. I, I, I just wonder whether it's, you know, I mean, in terms of like what your, your um, I don't know, your, your goal for the piece was, those composers kind of inhabit a, a, a similar kind of um, a similar world, you know, spiritually and musically. Um, but I think what they, they what they, they, they what they can do is use an economy of means, but also just just slightly change something that m will will make it you know bit bit more interesting and a bit more um, you know um, I don't know. Uh, Play with the expectations slightly. Mm. Um, they're, they're, they're my, they're, they're, they were just kind of my general thoughts about the the musical background. But um, yeah, sure. I, I don't know if you did. You see a film recently called Midsummer? I, I have, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, I, I don't know what you thought of the soundtrack for that film, but I thought it was brilliant. Um, oh. And this, 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 the, the kind of ethereal harmonic-y kind of Sol Ponticello thing. I think at the, at the end of the film, you know, when he, they burn to death in the big yellow thing. Yeah. Yeah. I find the, mu the music to that incredibly moving. Right, but right. There's, there's, a, there's a moment where, there's a moment where there's an A in that shallows, there's a harmonic shift and the A is very present. And it just reminded me of that and reminded me there's a kind of ground bass which goes through that piece, that that kind of section. Again, I think it's one of the reasons why it it struck me being they, they kind of there was a similarity was the the kind of atmospheric nature and in particular the I would say the um, you know I, I don't want to say lack of but I want to say the absence of melody, and I think. I wonder whether or not you might think about adding some kind of prominent melodic lines somewhere yeah, that, sure. that come out and, and, and interplay or, or e even actually, you know, even a voice. I, I really hear this to me. Uh, this is like a gorgeous backdrop to a, a vocal settings, like a haiku or, um, you know, some kind of, of poetic narrative. Um, that will would, would I don't even maybe you could like add some of the text from the Virginia Woolf into the piece or something yeah. and, or like maybe there's a character that comes out because 
this there's just there's this one thing that I just think I I I, I want yeah, the foreground and background. Yeah, I think this there's, there's something to say about that. Um, sure. yeah. But I, I you know I think that the the, the 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 breath effects work really well. I'm I'm always a bit I, I I'm a bit dubious about the about breath noises and key clicks and things like this. Yeah. I think, <laughs> you know I think if you're gonna do it post Lachenmann, I think you've got to do it with real integrity and intent, or to create a, a you know a, 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 a sound painting or a pic, a picture or something. And I think it really does evoke, you know the 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 waves and the and and the the sea and breathing you know there's that there's that yeah there. yeah i used to be kind of averse to extender techniques as well and then yeah. so the composer that sort of really got me back onto it was Sharino, yeah which i've been kind of obsessed with um so that's sort of got me yeah i guess that i've sort of started to integrate them back into my mm -hmm. music yeah, and I, just in terms of like this idea of transcendence again and transience, I, I would look at um, I would look at George Lentz in particular, and there's mm. there's a piece, it's pronounced, it's spelled G U Y, G H A M, and I think it's like Gyungam or Gyungam. I can't pronounce it because it's like Aboriginal. Um, but in terms of the, the kind of state that you want to kind of, um, I don't know what's the word, like depict or kind of enter into, he does, he yeah. does it so well. And it's very difficult to do, to, to create that kind of um, sense of, of, you know, being in another ether or kind of floating somewhere. Um, yeah, but I, 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 as I said, I mean, I think it's an absolutely, I think it's a lovely piece and I've, I've enjoyed listening to it. Um, it's kind of like kept me, yeah, kept me going today. Okay, I think we should move on now. Um, I think we should hear, hear some music now, hear some, some Simpson played by a, a clarinetist. And so Seb, I don't know if you want to say anything before you start playing or do you want to just go into straight playing? Or Mark, would you like to introduce the piece? Um, well, I, I'll just say something about the piece, you know, just just just, just briefly. Um, so this was written in 2012, and it was written directly after I'd written a, a piece to open the last night of the proms in 2012. So it was this big five minute kind of firecracker um, and lots of energy, very densely orchestrated, very kind of uh, in your face. And I wanted to write something which was very different to that and more intimate. Um, and so this is, this is what came out and, um, the idea ab about this piece is, is that the, the material between the clarinet and the piano is often so similar that you can't discern between whether or not it's the clarinet playing or the piano playing. Obviously we don't have a, a piano today, but just imagine that there's a piano playing in the background somewhere. Um, and the, you know, there's, the, there are various techniques that I use throughout the piece that kind of make, make that happen. Um, not least things like subtone playing into the piano itself. Um, but I, I, from a clarinetist point of view, it, it, the, the difficulty in this piece is really in the really kind of the, the softer, quieter sections. Um, there are there's, there's moments that kind of explode later on, but generally speaking, the, the kind of the virtuosity lies in the, the real nuance of the, 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 the quieter things. So I hope that gives you a bit of a sense of what it's like.
can I just stop you there? And can we just talk about some little things? Is that all right? So we just keep everyone, <laughs> keep the momentum going because it could be a while like this. Um, that's that. That's great. There's there's a there's there's, there's a lot there. I think I, I don't know how I don't know how many people know this or how or people have come to it or whatever, but. And obviously, you're doing a really great job with no piano and no, <laughs> over the over the net. Um, I think the the thing that you need to think about is is a bit more of, um, suspension and just kind of openness. It's it's not it's not the the, the beat in this piece is very flexible. Um, it's it's molto rubato all the time, um, and you can you can not be so strict. But the, the the real trick is trying to get the the semitone trills um uh, sorry the semitone glisses as smooth as possible so i mean for all of the composers there uh, forgive me if i'm telling you how to suck eggs and this is a really obvious thing but you know um in not all of the keys of the clarinet um have keys like this they're they're open keys that you can actually lift your fingers off and do glissandos between so it means that some of the notes you can you can you can glist between. Um, the the trick is to be able to do to to do it very smoothly. It's um, a com a combination of not only a loosening of the embrasure, which um, and slow slowly moving the finger so delicately that because you can see that this key here, it it's got a spring in it, so it just bounces back up. And the, 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 the trick is to try to counteract the spring mechanism so smoothly and so um, quietly that you don't hear a click or you hear uh, a jump. So there should, there, shouldn't, there should be absolutely no jump and there should be a really seamless semitonal gliss. So, As opposed to, you, you understand. I mean, we're talking like very minute differences, but the it should be very smooth as as, as possible. Do you want to just just do you want to just try that from say as in bar bar six or so? So one of the things that I do as well to try and slightly fake it is put more of your finger across the key. So you, you almost push the mechanism down a bit more before you just go, da da. you know, it's a very smooth trick where you kind of, you, 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 coax, you coax the key and then glide over the, the thing at the same time. very tricky but that's that that is that's 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 the key i'm gonna give it one more go and see see what it's like yeah so it, it is possible um so yeah, so composers that you know you, you can you can get the very seamless um, microtonal almost you know um, pitches and, and and glisses between these these keys. It takes a bit of a a bit of practice, but you know you, you can you can do it. Um, the, the other thing that I do as well, um, just at the bar at the end of bar twenty five, can can you just can you just show what you're doing in the side keys on the on the instrument i think if if those of you who know the the clarinet repertoire well this is a technique from Lindbergh's clarinet concerto 
So what 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 Ted's going to do is hold down that E, and then use one side key, and keep trilling, but then also add the other keys down. Can you just can you just play to them what that sounds like? Yeah, and th there's a whole passage in the Lindbergh Clarinet Concerto that uses that technique of going through. Things like that, um, which is quite a cool technique where you can play around with these, these, these side keys and then move these, you know, just use the, the left hand there. So I, I, I use that slightly. Um, do you want to go on to, the, to, to pay the next page? The, this next bit is, this is much more lyrical um, more, more of a kind of outburst. So this is the time we get to play out. I'm gonna go from bar 29 or something. Yeah, good, good. There's a lot of good stuff there. Um, just a few things. The, the quintuplet in a D, that, the 7 8, that should be a bit quicker. And also the septuplet in bar 42, that should be a bit quicker too. And the other thing I was, would say is really use the, the articulation that you've got to add a bit more power and a bit more force. So even in bar 45, when you go, ba da dee da 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 ba da dee da 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 da. They should, they should really bring them out. Can you just show the, everyone what technique you're using there in bar 55 as composers? It's interesting to notice this little um, microtonal inflection. So if you, if you hold down one of the side keys, I, I, again, I, uh, you all know this, and forgive me for um, composers for um, telling you how to suck eggs, but the, cl the clarinet doesn't overblow at the octave, overblows at the 12th. And so that me and we have these side keys here. Oh, <laughs> Sorry, I can't turn my phone off. Um, and so if you if you hold down one of these, and then still move your fingers here, you get these really interesting microtonal inflections. And that moment comes when the piano has the same pitch and it's a kind of little squiggle over that. Um, do you want to just carry on, F? The, all of these little melodic fragments mirror the piano, so it's meant to sound like a kind of cascade of thing. Um, we should go on to this next section, and there's a, I don't know if any of the, the composers here are aware of the, um, the whale sound that the clarinet can make. Don't know if, no. Um, so 
if you play or hold down the key for a, a B in the middle of the register, and then if you hold the clarinet on your, your leg, and then with your thumb, but that's three now because you can hold it on your clarinet. If you can hold, if you can, I can see if I can, what's the easiest way for me to explain this? Uh, there we go. If you put these two keys down, keep them hold, keep them held, and then do a kind of chromatic, we'll do a chromatic scale. You get this very interesting whale kind of sound. It's kind of cool. Um, and it's also slight, it's, it's, you have to like lean the clarinet on your leg. So it all, it all, it kind of looks like it's a bit of a dramatic moment for the audience. Seb, can you just show them how you do this whale noise? Yeah, so the, the thing is, it's, I'm actually in the process of editing this clarinet part because there's some things which aren't like completely clear, but one of them is that there should be a bit more time between that first one going down and then the next one going up, down and back up, kind of. Yep. But, yeah. Um, and then, do you want to go from I? Can you go from I? Yep. Yeah, the, the B is a tricky one. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you've just got to give it, give it all, everything you've got there. The, yeah, the, the, the thing is here, just one thing, the, in bar 83, that's still a G flat. So, you know. Yeah. Um, I think just in terms of like my, what characterizes my music in, in general, usually these melodic lines, which are very kind of searing, and then these outbursts, you know, there's a, the clarinet and, piece, clarinet and piano piece of mine from 2006 called Lovescape, which I did for Young Musician of the Year semi-final. And essentially that has like the DNA for a lot of the kind of music that I wrote afterwards, you know, things which are very, very, um, melodic um, and really as beautiful as possible and then <laughs> okay so I think you really got to make that apparent there you know so make the melodic lines really sing that kind of thing so um, and and yeah and, and drama this is like a bit of a, a moment for drama now I should say the end in have you, have you never you've not done this with piano before? No. no. The the ending is pretty tricky. Just so that, just so you know that um, for everyone else who doesn't have a score, the last twenty five bars is essentially a really slow long glissando up from a, a, a G sharp here to. G. Now, and we're talking about glissandos of intervals, like a semitone over a bar. 
um, maybe like a minor third over a bar. It's very, it's very, very, very tricky to be able to. So the, the 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 key is here is um, control control and, and don't don't play it too quietly because I've done this before and I've played it very quiet and I've kind of like lost it. Um, the the main thing is the drama of the how slow you can get that microtone that semitone to go. Um, do you want to do you want to just give that give that a try? Again, we're talking about. An, in, an incredible amount of control between a, a key in a semitone over a very, very long period. Um, dif difficult. It is hard. <laughs> but, yeah, let me just try it. Yeah, that's good. It's 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 very hard, <laughs> and it's it's obviously it, it, uh, at the same time the piano is iterating crotchets. Gives you the pause, but and then and then it just slightly changes. So the piano goes up with you at the same time. Um, well, I I would use the the right hand B flat there for the first one. One hundred and five. And I wouldn't use the back here. Go, I'd go from that to that. So the B flat thing. So. Yeah, sorry. I, <laughs> I've got the added advantage of having written this piece and also played it ten for ten years. <laughs> so uh, I, I apologize for, <laughs> for for that. But anyway, yeah, that, that do you wanna just try that that last one up the last kind of five bars or so? This this is the end of the gliss and then we finish with that little kind of whale noise. From maybe from bar one two one. One two one. Yeah, if that last gesture is a bit more dramatic and you imagine you playing it into the... Actually, what I actually do is put the bell into the piano. Yeah. I, I usually have like a, um, a pull-through or a cloth inside the piano because you, I, I've done it, I've knocked, I've gone, <laughs> put the clarinet in the piano. <laughs> but you, if you go... It's got to have a little kick towards the end so it resonates inside. Yeah. But brilliant. Thank you so much for playing that. I mean, there's only one other person I've heard play that piece. So <laughs> brilliant. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Um, anybody, composer or clarinetist, want to ask Mark or Seb anything about certain things of that piece or advice. 
Um, can, can I just ask Mark one thing? You think you say one other person that you know has, has played it? I mean, how did the how did their interpretation differ from yours, or well, did you hear it even? Yeah, I was there. It was in Budapest last last December at the List Academy, and it was a, a student there, and he did a really brilliant job. I was really moved by it. Um, again, just maybe not too dissimilar from James James's piece. There's a there's a kind of sense of suspension. And um, the, I think there can be something to be said about the kind of the loaded emotion that is in that kind of heightened state of thing. Uh, he, he did a he did a great job. Um, he, actually, you can see his performance online as well if you just type in. There's there's two. I think there's two videos of me doing this, um, and there's one. And his his is there as well. It's, it's really good. Um, but again, yeah, the, the 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 difficulty in this piece lies in in the the real the subtle kind of key changes and very quiet glissandi all of which are all of which are possible but just require you know just a little bit of um practice yeah and of course that will be more pronounced because it's set against the piano that can't do things like that exactly yeah have you written anything for just solo clarinet yeah there's an um there are two pieces i've written there's there's, there's a mad um kind of quasi improvised solo piece i've written called darkness moves which has about every single um, extended technique under the sun in that piece, and um, and then I wrote I wrote some of the pieces last year for the ARD competition, the clarinet competition, um, this year round, which were more lyrical and less m- maniac. <laughs> and, uh, um, again, that that piece of of my, the darkness moves that's on. That is on um, online, and the funny—I mean, I, I looked—I looked, I looked uh, the, the camera. I uh, mean, the, playing the clarinet on video is not a very flattering experience, to say the least. And all of the camera angles were from underneath, right. <laughs> and every time I kind of went like this, I looked like a kind of inflated thumb man. Um, <laughs> He was having an aneurysm of some kind, so it's not the most flattering. It's not the most flattering video, but you know, playing the clarinet really isn't meant to be. Well, at least that piece is not a very flattering piece to, to play. Oh, and um, I love some of the close-ups you were giving just now. They were very alarming. <laughs> well, you can see much. You can see more of those on the on the on, on the YouTube video if you if you like. Right, right. Um, but, th- but thank you very much, Seb, for that. Um, thank you, Seb. Yes, yes. And uh, so we now move to um, our next composer, Athanasia. And um, perhaps you'd like to say a few things about the piece, then we'll perhaps see it and hear it. And then it's over to you and Mark. Sure. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Mark. Thanks for this. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm Athanasia. I'm um, 24. This was my third year in college. I was doing a postgraduate diploma. Uh, but before that, I did my master's um, there as well. And I wrote this orchestral piece uh, this year. Um, and it was meant to be uh, works of by the Halle uh, Orchestra, but because of lockdown, it has been postponed for now. And it's called Vulnerable, and um, it, it, it's all about vulnerability because I, I was thinking about the concept a lot uh, at the time, and I was thinking about how it's perceived to be a a negative thing for our society, but actually it can it can mean a lot of different things. And it, can mean, it can mean strength. It can mean uh, being alive and being open to things. Uh, so I just wanted to do a piece that um, kind of show the different um, aspects of, of what this world can mean. And um, I try to kind of incorporate elements uh, further in the instrumental writing that sort of convey uh, vulnerability in one way or another, or the uh, the harmonic language uh, kind of conveys vulnerability. Um, yeah, I think that, 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 that's a good starting point. I can try playing it now.
Bravo. Again, I mean, this, I, I really, really enjoy this piece and I've listened to it again as, as much as I have James's piece. Um, there's there's a lot of a lot of brilliant things in it, and I think that one of the the, the most extraordinary things about the piece I think is the structure and how we're able to say so much in such a short amount of time. Um, I wanted to talk to you about this title and about the concept of vulnerability. Um, Maybe I'm a bit too English and a bit too sentimental, but I, 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 from from my point of view, I, I I struggle to hear the the vulnerability. I'm not I'm not I'm not saying that, that that's that it's not there. It's just that my interpretation of it, I, I think it's a very powerful piece. I think it's a very strong piece, and it's it's it doesn't doesn't really sound vulnerable to me. Um, and I and I wondered whether or not, you know that title itself was something that you really wanted to stick to or maybe you might be interested in for me i think the piece is a little symphony and i i, I would I, I i wonder whether you might be interested in you know calling it you know symphony number one or little symphony or um because the, there's something very um formal about it and structured. I don't know, I'm rambling, but do, maybe let's open that up. Like, what, what do you think about those things that I'm just sort of saying? Sure, yeah, that, that's very interesting, thank you. Uh, well, yes, I think uh, to what you said about it sounding strong, I, 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 yeah, that's a great compliment actually, because I mean, I think that's what I was thinking about the whole concept of vulnerability, how it is perceived to be something, it, 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 it is perceived to perceived to be a weakness but actually can mean a lot of uh, a lot of strength uh, but yeah I, I, I take your point that I mean I, not necessarily every listener would um, would find that the title suits the, the piece and it was more to, it, had, it had more to do with what I was yeah. Finding a title for a piece, it's just that, you know, it's, it's a funny old business, isn't it? Like, I mean, sometimes I, I, it's definitely happened to me before where I've written pieces without a title and then have to find something at the last minute and think, oh, you know, uh, or, and, and, or sometimes I've, I mean, in recent, in the, in the last couple of, you know, years, I've, my, my titles have been very um, kind of standard, you know, concerto, cello, concerto, clarinet, concerto, three pieces, whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I don't know if it's, um, I did, did you, did you feel as though you'd experienced that? Was it, did you write the piece before you had the kind of concept in mind? No, I, I wrote the piece with the concept in mind from, from the very start, but, um, the title came last because I, um, yeah, like I said, I think for pretty much every piece of mine, I come up with the title at the very at the very last moment because I, I, I often struggle with it. Um, so yeah, I, will, I, will, I was wondering as to like to what extent would I want the audience to know that I was thinking about that while I was writing the piece. Because very often in other pieces I think about other things that I don't ever reveal to, to, to the audience or the yeah. rest. They don't make it to the title or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. For, it's interesting for me to just to see how how I reacted to it, and I and I saw it as something a bit more formulaic. And, and I remembered it. I remembered a time when I oh, there was a there was an like a, a classic FM did a, a an orchestral composition competition back in oh my god, this must have been about two thousand and early two thousands two three four something like this. It was called the the classic FM Master Prize, and um, the composers from around the world were invited to write and I remember there being a, a, a symphony other pieces other, other composers had written um, tone poems and um, I remember there was a very short symphony and I was kind of and I thought you can't have a you can't have a 10 minute symphony what's that and and and, and, I, and, I, and I've also been thinking again more about because I, I thought maybe I'd like to write a symphony and what that what that means um, and it's almost some, I don't know whether the titles which are maybe a bit more archaic, like symphony and concerto or whatever, 
I don't know whether they, I don't know, maybe they have some kind of conservative connotation to them today, as opposed to something which is, you know, like a kind of cool, you know, well, you know, like a more of a vocative title. Um, but I, 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 I don't know, I'm, I'm just kind of posing the question, I'm just talking about, you know, whether or not, I mean, what, what, what is your, you know, um, relation to those kinds of, of, of titles? Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind them. I don't think, I think, um, I've only made one piece, uh, Sonata, which was actually for, uh, solo clarinet. So it was just for Sonata for clarinet because I, yeah, I had that structure in mind. Uh, I, I wouldn't mind using it, but, uh, for this particular piece, I, I really didn't think of it as a symphony. Right. So no, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm laboring the point. I'm just, well, I'm just kind of like talking about things, but, uh, no, I, yeah, it's it's that's the thing. I just wanted to mention some pieces that came to mind as I as I listened to it. Um, the third section re really sounded like kind of like a late Copeland to me. Um, I, I, these these kind of open fifths and and the the kind of syncopated rhythms. And I was just wondering whether you knew pieces like um, the connotations for orchestra. These kind of the, um, or even even stuff like the, the piano quartet when he kind of goes into a he kind of like Stravinsky when he starts to use twelve tone technique he keeps that Copeland DNA that Stravinsky DNA um, the, the, I, I don't know I just, there's something um, it sounded there was a kind of American landscape somehow that was kind of ba 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 bing kind of thing um, and the other thing as well just in terms of rhythmic development and I think as well. Uh, this, this isn't meant. This isn't meant as a as a um, this uh, um, as a dig or anything. But it's it's you know the, the Michel van der R also use has a kind of it's because it's because the, there's a MIDI file. It's very um, well. It, it's MIDI, <laughs> um, and and I think Michel van der R's music has the kind of um, almost like robotic kind of. Um, uh, expressivity to it, which I think actually this piece doesn't have. I mean, when 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 it's going to be played by a, a you know a live orchestra, all of the things will come to life. But I think M Michelle's music has this kind of like robotic kind of formulated thing to it, and it just rem there were just moments that reminded me of the the violin concerto of Michelle van der Aar. I don't know if you know that piece, um, yeah. but I'll Spotify. Um, just in terms of um, it, it's a 25-ish minute piece, um, and ha like just in terms of rhythmic variation, um, and and also the, the way he utilizes the orchestra, um, which we will get into. But anyway, th those were just like two pieces which I thought maybe you might be interested in or kind of resonate. Um, the 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 opening for me. That this I just wanted to talk to you about this this kind of little bit of micro polyphony that we have just before B. Um, again, you know, what, 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 what kind of decisions are you making here and what kind of, what, what's governing these decisions? Uh, yes, for, for, uh, when, it, when it comes to... Um, just yeah, the, the, like the interaction of the, 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 the polyphony, the, the lines before B, you know, there's, there's this, this, Mm-hmm. Yes, well, I, I, I just wanted to, um, to have a texture that, um, was right, kind of slowly built. Right, yeah. Um, there's no, sorry? That there's no kind of, like, overarching, uh, kind of, that there's no kind of system or a process which is making these things go the way they are. It's just kind of free, free-flowing. Not necessarily, no. Uh, the there's no system, but um, I guess the uh, the intervals that kind of predominate in, in that section are um, semitones or um, mm -hmm. or like diminished octaves. If you look at it the, the, mm -hmm. the other way around, or um, yeah, so the, the, this sort of um, harmonic world, and then the the string writing of that section also has the, this um, yeah this this intervals kind of dominating. Uh, so the string blanket underneath, kind yeah. of like 
kind of reflects what's going on at the wind section at the same time. I, I really like that chord that comes in a B. That, that's, it's, it's, it's very powerful. Um, the, yeah, and and then the build the, the, the build up into the second movement that there's a there's a real kind of momentum that picks up. I think this rhythmic section in the up up to the third section it's very you know it's 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 really cool. <laughs> I like it a lot. Um, again, is this is this kind of more free flowing kind of rhythmic procedures here, or are you um, is there something which is is governing the this material. Uh, is this for the, the second section? Is that the third section? Uh, the third section. Yeah, I, uh, it, it was pretty in intuitive, like this section as well. Because yeah. it, it, I do get the sense of that. It just it feels like a very, a very like well controlled kind of free flowing set of ideas that are just just kind of really merging in, into one. And would are you, in terms of the future of this piece, are, are you seeing it kind of remaining as it is, or would you like to kind of expand on it or make, um, you know, uh, build on it in some way? Well, yeah. Well, I think um, I would kind of live live it alone as it as it is to just be like a, a version on its own. But if I if I could, I think I I would like it to be longer in general. Mm. I think the the final section could be much longer. It could be extended with something much right. longer. Um, or that that if I if I were to keep the sort of like sectional nature of it, I would probably add more sections that were quite uh, diverse and yeah, di different. Mm. Um, yeah, I think I think this uh, that. This question opens up something else which I'm interested in, and I and I actually end up talking to a lot of um, composers about is this idea of development, um, and you know what, and and process, um, and you you know what what constitutes an idea, and then how do we govern the development of that idea, whether or not it goes ad you know ad absurdum ad infinitum to the you know it's kind of extreme, I think. Ligeti does that a lot, and I think Tom Adas also took that idea of of taking a a, a, a figuration and then expanding it into its until it finishes and then moving on. I mean that's one way of developing material, but um, I, I yeah I just think if you're thinking I don't know if you, I mean if you if 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 you thought maybe motivically or. Um, melodically in that sense whether they would you know it would be the, the development would be governed in that way I mean the one way I dealt with developing material or, or kind of making sure sections w would feel as though they would move from one to the other was a technique that actually Gary Carpenter taught me when I was a student of his back in in Liverpool in 2006 seven ish um, and that was, I mean, I remember I was writing a piece for Ensemble 1010 at the time and I was, I, I'd written uh, a, a something and I'd taken it to him and I said, I don't know, I don't know what to do with it. I'm stuck. And, and, it, and he said, well, what you're doing is you're writing two pieces simultaneously. And the material went A, B, A, B, A. And so he said, take out the, all the A's, put them together and take the B. And take, but still, once I'd had that material, there needed to be a sense of the sections kind of morphing in, into each other. And so what he recommended to me was to use a stopwatch. And so I, I, I would use the stopwatch and then listen to the material in my, in my mind, in my ear. And when I felt as though the next section needed to happen, I would make a little mark and say, okay, that's 30 seconds. And I, so I've got this idea, and I've got to get to this next section using this thing. So I'd made this musical problem. And so in that case, that's when things like, I mean, we're talking about I mean, even just basic things like kind of Schembergian rotations and, and, and retrograde and things from a motivic point of view. Of course, it depends on the material, but um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just kind of 
expunging and talking out talking out loud about ideas of development. And the the other thing as well, looking at that micropolyphony again, is it, it reminded me of I watched the other day the, the, the Ligeti Requiem on the Ensemble into Contemporain YouTube channel, which if 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 people don't know that YouTube channel, it's a brilliant resource for contemporary music, the Ensemble into Contemporain. They have incredible performances of really, you know, the the standard um repertoire. Um, I, it just, it just, yeah, it just reminded me of those Ligetian, Ligetian kind of textures and thinking. Well, how can you, you know, how how do you, how do you deal with that material in time, and what does what what governs that direction? Um, I think the, these are questions that, yeah, that you should kind of consider. I mean, every composer should consider. You know, how do you get from A to B? Some people, you know, can Stravinsky does it, it blocks, but you know, there's there's something to be said for kind of motivic development and things. I think going back to Tom Ades, I think in seven days the piano concerto, I don't. That is a, a um, in terms of pro musical processes, I find that piece extraordinary, and I, I I mean I love a lot of well pretty much all of Tom's music, and I think that is by far. I, that's my favorite piece because of those that that level of detail of 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 development there's a fugue there's a two minute long fugue and the way it reaches its ending i mean it's 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 magnificent i mean it's really like top level composing skills you know um i think kind of going to make you you know your jaw drop but yeah um i think it I, again i think it's a i think it's a wonderful piece i think in my my opinion, I think it's like a little symphony, and I think each movement should be just drawn out a bit. Um, but that's totally just my opinion, and like you know, you can do what you want with that. Um, but I think you know, even as it stands, I do think it's, a, it's you know, it's a very 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 strong piece. The, the use of the um, the orchestra, um, the the sense of shape, um, the flow. Yeah, I I think I think once I, I'd love to hear it live played by you know a, a proper orchestra not a, a surveillance so one thing i what i was going to say i mean the, the end of the recording is just a bit clipped and just because of the thing but i i, I don't know if you would put like a writ a, a writ on the last bar or something you know for me it feels like it needs to just kind of go kind of thing i don't know if you think that or not but anyway they're they're, they're just my thoughts on 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 the piece, but I, I think you know it's you should be again really really proud. I think it's a brilliant, brilliant instrument. Just want to add. I mean, um, I, you know, I really enjoy just hearing the structure. I, mean, I don't want to comment on the actual sort of computer sound, but I mean, what I thought is that what of course what so many composers don't want to do is actually quote themselves in future pieces. And I think you've got actually a great resource in this piece to quote yourself in other pieces you write afterwards. There's so much good material that you just do quickly, and I'll just add in quite a vulnerable way some of the time. Yeah. Um, you know, because vulnerable, I, 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 we, we, we've talked about this, of course, and it means receptive. You know, and, and I think you know each section is receptive to what's happened before, mm -hmm. and I think there's a lot of what you. There is so much here that if you wanted to, you could almost take this exact material and just use it in three more pieces at least. Mm. You know, it'll be less hard work than this one. <laughs> That's yeah. a time saving tip, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So, uh, so look, it's, it's, has anybody got any comments about this particular piece? Um, I, I, I've been told now that people, if people want to just raise their hands, they should do it physically, so because I can see you all, rather than do little hands on the on the, on the screen. Anybody want to ask Athanasi or anything? Yeah, Jose. Hi. I'm um, sorry, there's a printer in the background. Um, I wanted to say that I did really enjoy the piece and about both the structure and the sound world of the piece, especially the sound world of the piece was something that I, it felt really familiar, but at the same time, I couldn't place where exactly you know, these things came from. So I wonder if there are like a specific um, source of inspiration that, that you have for this piece, something you're like, you want to share. Thank you. Thanks. As in, like pieces or or yeah. I think Not really. I was getting at the Copeland thing. I felt I felt the same. 
I, I, I thought, I know this piece, but I don't know it. That's, that's very interesting, because if I'm honest, I don't really know Kovla's music that, that well at all. I, yeah. I definitely wasn't listening to any um, Copeland. And I think that section, actually, it, it, it does sound quite different to uh, everything else I've written, just because I, yeah, uh, as you said, because I have the, the open fits and all of these harmonies, it just creates like a harmonic language that I ha haven't really used before, but I just wanted this kind of really joyous kind of exuberant ener mm. energy to it, so I guess it kind of ended up sounding like, uh, yeah, that, that sort of music. Jose, do you know the late Copeland piece I was talking about, the connotations for orchestra? No. Uh, I don't know it either, sorry. And actually the piece I was thinking about, and that, that probably says a lot more about me than it says on your piece. Um, I was thinking a lot about metabols. I was okay. thinking about duty year for a while, and I can't exactly place it. Like there's not the development that you have in metabols, and there's no, and some of the sound role is quite different. It may have to do only with you know the many movements like one after the other, the attacker feeling and the kind of like upbeat of the joyous ending, as well as you know the snappy kind of like third section. But you know, in in a way, I'm still really curious. Like, could you uh, were you listening to any specific orchestral music, or are there like any composers, like specific authors, like you feel like have made a mark in the writing of this piece? Yes. Uh, well, th thanks for the duty icon. I, I mean, I, I love that piece. So, I mean, it, yeah, thanks for saying that. It kind of reminded you of it. Um, I guess um, I, I, I really can't remember what, if I was listening to any music at, the, uh, at that time because I, I was quite busy. Uh, so I wasn't really spending a lot of time listening to music. Um, I, I love Kurtak's theory, I mean, that's something that, that has, uh, I guess, the last section, you could say, that kind of, kind of could, could resemble that a bit with the kind of hom homophonic structures. Um, I wanted to say, I wanted to mention that piece before as well, in relation to James's piece, actually, the, the, the horn voicings. Um, of course, there are, there are six horns in the, the Stele two of which are Wagner horns, Wagner tubers. Um, but just in terms of the, the, the voices and the sonorities, I thought they were very, very nicely done in, in, in that. But I did write Stele as well. Yeah. So another thing I thought is that, um, of course, there is a sort of noble 20th century um, lineage of ending pieces with big, massive chorales. And I mean, that goes back, Stravinsky, of course, does it quite a lot. I mean, symphony, mm. arm symphonies of wind instruments. But a piece I vaguely thought of, and I haven't heard it for a long time, is uh, is the end of Oliver Nusson's Third Symphony. I don't know if you've heard that. Mm. That ends in a sort of shimmering chorale. I think it's harmonic, it's quite different, but it's the way it sort of concludes things with it and, and pans out. It's like reaching for the stars again. Yeah. So, but it's a great piece. Mm. Right, thank you. I don't, I don't actually know that piece either, so, yeah. Anybody want, else want to ask um, Athanasi or anything in particular? Uh, Dom? Uh, hey, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. That was a really great piece. Um, uh, I was just, I was just a really quick comment, really. I, because um, we were talking about the structure and you said that you might possibly expand this. And there was a particular bit from after the sort of loud homophonic sort of middle section when it goes back into the more kind of micro polyphony where it was really really striking and you sort of had this like common tone that was being sort of held through from one into the other and, and I felt that section was really really good but it just could have gone on a bit longer I, I felt like I was, I was really reminded of Prokofiev's sixth if you know that there's a bit of, and it's different in lots of other ways, but at the end of the development of Prokofiev's sixth, it has the horn sort of holds this note through and it goes on for ages and it and it really, really works because he pushes it so far sort of thing. And it was just just a thought really that possibly that could have just, you could, if you could not notice the transition back into the micro polyphony, that might be quite effective. Which bit in the piece are you referring to? Sorry? Which bit in the piece are you referring to? Sorry? 
Uh, which p which mode? Oh, sorry. Um, coffee of six. The um the development. No of, in of six. no in Athanasius. Oh, in Athanasius. Um, so the bits. So there's lots of loud chords. Yeah. And then it's and then it um eventually it kind of reaches the more polyphonic micro polyphonic sort Towards of section again. And there's like a common tone being held through, I think. Um, yeah, the fifth, the fifth, the A, the fifth and the D and the A are quite strong. Yeah, it was it was that sort of bit, and I, I just I felt that was really effective, um, and whether that could just be pushed a bit further, sort of thing. Mm. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Just a thought. <laughs> nice. I think we have to stop now. I'm sorry. Um, so look, Mark, it's been fantastic. It's lovely to hear your music, your thoughts about our composer's music, and your thoughts generally. So can we all thank Mark? No, brilliant. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And um, so please, I would please come to the RNCM when we're open again. And let's do something live. I would love to. And of course, you know, I was meant to be here with you all like a couple of weeks ago. And so I was very sad not to, to have spent the day working with you and yeah and seeing you all but um yeah i th thanks for inviting me again and um you know look after yourselves i hope you're all kind to yourselves and that you just don't you know just don't 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 get too pent up by the situation i think yeah. <laughs> absolutely absolutely well look, look forward to seeing you soon and thanks everybody for coming thank you then all right bye, -bye. Then. bye. bye.